Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Rivera, and I am so excited to talk to really my first guest for the Jeff Rivera Morning Show, and she is my very good friend, Marcella Landris, and we've known each other for probably almost 10 years, I think, by now, really, Oh, my right? goodness, probably, at least. Yeah, at least 10 years, you know, so we're old friends. And uh, she actually, um, I'm really excited to talk to her about the topic, but let me just tell you a little bit about Marcella, first of all. that She was actually a former editor at Simon & Schuster, and she is the author of How Editors Think, The Real Reason They Rejected You. You have to read this book. I absolutely love it, and I actually quote from it quite a bit whenever I'm talking to people. And um, she's working on an exciting product with a hope that we can talk about a little bit later on, and that's Comadres y Compadres Writers Conference, which is coming up soon, I believe in the fall. Um, she'll be telling us a little bit about that. So, But the, today's topic is a rather interesting topic that I'm actually really excited to talk about. Now, those of you who are Latino um, – and you're interested in being an author, this may not be quite what you're looking for, but you need to hear it anyway. What we're going to be talking about today is the need that the industry has to have more Latino acquisition editors. And as Marcella is going to talk about today, we have more than enough authors. I mean, what we really need <laughs> is more acquisition editors that are Latino, and we're going to talk about that as a topic. So if you ever dreamed of or even had a passing thought of becoming an acquisition editor or want to know what that is in the first place, this is the place to be. I want to welcome Miss Marcella Landris. Thank you, Jeff. It's such a pleasure. So I'm really excited to have you this morning, Russell. I know it's really early um, this morning. It's about about 7 o'clock in the morning my time, about 9 o'clock in the morning your time. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Anything for you. Okay. So um, this is actually a really exciting topic, um, and I have quite a few questions. So first of all, before we get started, as I mentioned in the intro, you actually were an editor at Simon & Schuster. So can we talk a little bit about how you started your career as an editor? Oh, I'd love to. This is a story I tell often because I think it's enlightening to people who are curious about how to start um, or break into the business because it's not easy to do. To make a long story short, I was supposed to be the first doctor in my family, which is very common in immigrant families. My fam my parents are immigrants from Ecuador in South America. And uh, so I, they told me that I should be a doctor because I got good grades in school and loved to read. And I thought, okay. And I actually took pre-med in college and got as far as organic chemistry lab. And that's when I realized I was not meant to be a doctor. And that's the first time that I questioned my own values and priorities and goals and realized that the one thing I was passionate about was reading, not writing. I had no desire to be a writer. Uh, so I just changed my major from biology to English lit. I took a bunch of book publishing internships uh, to make sure that it was a good fit. Um, and to make a long story short, I took the uh, this a summer publishing course at various schools in the New York City area and even outside New York. Um, and I took the summer publishing course at NYU after I had graduated from college because despite the fact that I had graduated from Barnard College, which is a good school, as an English lit major and had had publishing internships on my resume, I knew that would not be enough to break in as an editorial assistant because for every job opening in the editorial department, especially at the major houses, there's a line of people outside the door. So um, at, when you take one of these summer publishing courses, they have a job fair at the end. And they tell all the students you cannot you know, apply for a job till the end of the six-week course. And that's when we'll have the job fair, and that's when we'll hook you up with you know, jobs at the publishing company. But I had lived long enough to know that if I waited till the end of the job fair, there will be no editorial positions. I might get a job in the mailroom. I might get a job in production or publicity, but the editorial job would be gone because those are the most glamorous. Mm -hmm. So I came to every class with my resume. And at the end of class, there would be a speaker who was usually someone from a real publishing house. It would be, you know, someone from production or someone from the children's department or someone from marketing. Whenever someone from editorial spoke, I would go up and get his card or her card and give them my resume. Mm. And eventually, the head of human resources, Simon Schuster, was in the room with us. And I went up to him and said, here's my resume, give me your card, I want to set up an interview. <laughs> and I called, and this is the really key part of the story, I called every day for two weeks. Mm. I stalked 
the man. He would not return my phone call. Finally, he had someone else in his department call me back and say, I understand you want to meet with us. There are no job open openings at all in all of Simon & Schuster, but you may come in for an informational interview. Hmm. Now, I knew that was a lie because a company as large as Simon & Schuster always has an opening. There's always a job. It may not be the job I wanted, but they always – so I knew that was a lie. So I came in prepared for that informational interview to make that human resources person love me. And sure enough, by the end of the interview, she said, you know, there actually is a position open in editorial that I think would be right for you. And she set up the appointment. And when I sat down for the interview, and this is another key part of the story, and I'm sorry it's so long, but it, it, I, this is what folks really need to know about how to break into the industry. When they asked me the crucial question during the interview, why do you want to be in book publishing, I did not say because I want to read books. That's what everyone says. That's not going to get you the job. Mm -hmm. I had to convince them that I could make money for them because that's what editors do. They invest the money of the publishing company, not in stocks and bonds and mutual funds, but in authors and manuscripts that have a chance of making money, making profit for that publishing company. So I sat there and I said, I'm Latina, I'm from the projects. I want to publish books that even people who don't read books read. I want to publish books for Latinos. You, Simon & Schuster, do a good job of publishing books for African Americans, especially women's fiction. You don't seem to have very many books for Latinas, especially commercial women's fiction. Mm -hmm. I, and I said, I think I could be the one to fill that hole for you. Mm. That's why they hired me, because I presented myself as someone who was looking to make money for them. Plus, I stopped the human resources director, which helped <laughs> But how did how you I know that? Started. I mean, how did you, did you just intuitively know to say those things? Did someone tell you that? or? You know? Well, I realized when I, when I was sitting in the summer publishing course at NYU, I looked around, and I was the only Latina in the room. There might have been another Latino boy in the room, but I think other than that, I was it. And there was a lot of discussion about Terry McMillan and Waiting to Exhale and how that how profitable books by and for African Americans was. This was back in 1996. So Waiting to Exhale was in the early 90s, and that changed the world. Before Waiting to Exhale, books by and for black people didn't make money. They might have won awards. They might have been made into films. They might have been, you know, there was the occasional literary novel that, you know, by and for black folk that got attention, but none had made money. Waiting to Excel was the first one that made significant money for a publishing house, for, for a major publishing house. And I sat there thinking, why are they talking about black authors? Why aren't they talking about Latino authors? Where's our Latino Waiting to Excel? Where's our Latino Terry McMillan? And I was like, you know what? I need to find her. The industry, that's a hole in the industry. They, they're making money hand over fist with black writers. They want to make money hand over fist with Latino writers. They just don't know they do. I have to tell them. That's how I got the idea. <laughs> right. Honestly, that's, very... that's, that's literally how I got the idea. That's fantastic. And, I, and we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, a famous author who you had a hand in her success a little bit later. But before we do, um, what does acquisition editor do exactly? Well, really, you know, as I sort of alluded to earlier, Acquisition editors are not writing coaches, they're not mentors, uh, they're not writing teachers. What, it's not their job to nurture talent. It's not their job to help writers become better writers. Their job is really more like financial investors. A financial investor will take your money and invest it in stocks and bonds and mutual funds with the objective of creating profit for your investment. You're going to have more money at the end of the day working with a financial planner than before. So editors are like financial investors that they take the publishing company's money and invest it in writers and manuscripts and book proposals with the objective of creating profit for the publishing company. They're not looking to lose money. At the end of the day, they want the publishing company to have more money than they started with. And that's really what an – that's why they're acquisitions editors. So their job is to take the publishing company's money – you know, buy a book and get it into the marketplace, get it into bookstores as soon as possible so they can make a return on their money. So it's not to their advantage to take on an author who needs a year or three or five or ten to produce the great American novel. They need something that they can get out into the world and start selling now to make back the money they invested in publishing it and producing it and printing it and marketing it and distributing it. And the easier they can do that, the more likely they are to... Yes. Okay. All else being equal, if you have two writers 
And <clears throat> one is a fantastic, glorious writer who maybe one day will win a Pulitzer or a major award. But his novel will take 10 years before it's polished. And then you have a second writer who is, you know, average, but it's, he's a great storyteller. It is perfect. Not a single word has to be edited. All you have to do is slap on a cover and get it out there. The second novel is the one that's most likely to get published, not the first one, because editors are paid to publish books that create profit. They're not paid to publish books that are well-written. If a book can make money that's well-written, they'll publish it. But if a book can make money and is not well-written, they'll publish that too. <laughs> that's, no, that's why so much of what you see in the bookstore is not necessarily well-written. Hmm. So, so if I'm interested in being an acquisition editor and I'm Latino or Latina, mm -hmm. what are the perks and what can I expect to be paid? Um, the there are very few perks. It's not the music industry where you have bling and private jets and you know Cristal. The only real perk are free books. And the glory of working in an industry where you are surrounded by people who are educated, intelligent and have a strong sense of curiosity, people who love to learn, and which are probably people like you, because if, you're, if you want to be an editor, you are probably intelligent and educated and curious and love to learn. And, you, and being an acquisitions editor is like being in an eternal graduate program. You're always reading, you're always learning. And if you love to read and you love to learn, there's no greater gratification than being an editor and working with writers. So those are the pluses. The downside is um, the money, the salary. My starting salary at Simon & Schuster back in 1996 was $23,000 a year. In New York? In New York. So I'm going to repeat that. So my starting salary in 1996 was $23,000 a year. But I was thrilled with that because I knew how to be poor. <laughs> No, really. So everyone out there listening thinking, I can't live on that. Well, first of all, that's 1996. Things have changed. It's now 2013. You know, we're having this conversation in August 2013. So I would say nowadays the starting salary for editorial assistants are probably closer to $30,000 a year. So it's a bit better, but that's not a lot of money in New York City. And if you're thinking, I can't live on that, if you, if you know how to be poor, living on $30,000 a year is easy because I, I grew up in projects. My parents were immigrants. My dad was a fireman. My brother was a cop. We, I didn't come for money. So everything I owned as a kid was a hand-me-down. Uh, I went to public school. You know, um, It took me eight years to graduate from Barnard because I was poor. I didn't have the money. Um, so I worked my way through school, and I always had two or three jobs just to make ends meet. I know what it's like to have to do without food so that I can pay the rent. Poor people know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So living on $23,000 a year was a move up for me because I it was one job. I had good health benefits. I didn't have to commute from one job to the second job to the third job. So for me, I, I was moving on up. Um, and, you know, every year if you do good work, hopefully you get a little raise. So but my point is, if you're Latino and you're thinking, I come from a very modest background and my parents want me to be a doctor and lawyer, they're not going to be happy with me being an editor. Well, my parents aren't happy with that I'm an editor. They, 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 to, to this day, they have no idea where they went wrong. They're like, Marcella's supposed to be a doctor. She's an <laughs> editor. What went wrong? But I'm happy. So if you're Latino, the biggest thing holding you back from having a career in book publishing are your parents, is your culture. Because immigrant culture is about immigrants coming to this country and raising children and grandchildren who live the American dream, and the American dream is all about financial security. They want their kids and grandkids to be doctors and lawyers and bankers and work on Wall Street, and, or at the very least, you know, on a more modest scale, be social workers and be teachers, because at least that's a steady income. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes to this country thinking, I'm going to raise a writer, I'm going to raise an editor, I'm going to raise an agent, because there's far less financial security. But that's what the book publishing industry needs. So for me to have become an editor, I needed to be a bad Latina. Mm -hmm. I had to disobey my parents. I respect my parents. I love them, but I'm not going to obey them. And my best advice to anyone out there, any Latino or Latina who's thinking seriously about becoming a book editor or having any kind of career in book publishing is 
love your parents, respect them, but don't obey them. Right. I can imagine also a, a, a perk um, is being able to change people's lives, not only um, for readers, you know, and, and, and um, you know, kind of bring into the world books that can change your lives, but the authors themselves who may not have had an opportunity otherwise if they didn't have a Latino or Latina um, acquisition editor. That's a great insight. You're absolutely right. Um, one of the reasons I became a, a book editor is because I felt that there weren't enough books being published by and for Latinos. And to me, a clear, the number one reason that was the case is that there weren't enough Latina editors. So I was like, okay, I'll become an editor and I'll publish Latino voices because, I mean, there are a number of people in industry who, you know, who say they want to publish Latino authors and occasionally they do, but Latino editors have a passion for Latino writers that non-Latino editors just don't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just organic. So, um, and I know it's been true for me. I've helped so many Latino writers get published, not just as an acquisitions editor at Simon Schuster, but now as a freelance editor. Um, and also as a co-founder of this writing conference, the Comadres and Combates Writing Conference, like I, pretty much everything I do is with the intention of empowering Latino writers to do everything they can to improve their chances of being published. Right. Now, let me ask you some hard questions here. Um, we all would love to see a lot more Latino books in the world, and we need Latino editors, acquisition editors, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But is there really a market big enough to justify more Latino books? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I constantly hear from agents, most of whom are not Latino, by the way, that they are desperate to find Latino writers. They just don't know where to find them. And, of course, on the other side, I hear from Latino writers nearly every day that they want an agent. They just can't find any. And, you know, a lot of it is just connection, matchmaking, building bridges. And that's been since day one. That's always been an issue. But I think part of the issue is that even if every agent in the business was actively looking for Latino writers and finding them. And even if every Latino writer was ready to be published, because that's another big missing piece of the pie, the world doesn't need more Latino writers. There are plenty of talented Latino writers in the world. The problem is they're not ready to be published. Mm -hmm. They have not yet invested the time and energy to hone their craft, to build a platform, and to produce a manuscript that's publishable. Most of the Latino writers I meet have an early draft or a first draft. That's not going to get published. And they don't have a platform. That's not going to help them get published. So they have years of work, years of work. It takes years to hone your craft. It takes years to build a platform before they'll be ready to be published. But they have talent. They just need to invest the year or two or five or ten to be at a point where they can be published. So it's not the number of writers that's an issue. It's they, they haven't put in the work. Um, it's not even the agents. I hear from agents all the time who are looking for writers who are ready to be published now. Agents meet writers every day who are not ready. That's not going to pay the rent. But if every agent comes to every editor at every publishing house with a Latino writer ready to go, that editor has to want to publish that writer, and they have to know how to publish that writer. There aren't enough Latino editors. Mm -hmm. They just there are too few of them. But if there are so many talented Latino authors out there who, yes, need to hone their craft, and there are agents out there who would love to represent them if they're ready to go, and there are over 40 million Latinos in, the, in America, the majority of which are English-speaking. Mm -hmm. What's going on with a few Latino books that come out there in the world and just totally flop? One of the issues is that Latino readers have the unfortunate habit of buying one copy of a book by a Latino and sharing it with their 20 friends. <laughs> no, really, I once was at a... Um, a book event at Barnes & Noble in Union Square, which is one of their largest spaces. And it was an event for a Latino book. I, I forget the name of the author, but it, I think her name was Monica Brown. And it was a book about Latina mother, Latinas and their mothers. And one of the Latinas who was featured in the book with her mother was Esmeralda Santiago. So Esmeralda Santiago was in the audience, even though she was not the author. Mm -hmm. And during the Q&A, Someone stood up and asked Esmeralda, how do you get an agent? How do you get published? I'm an inspiring writer. Could you give me advice? And Esmeralda stood up and took the microphone and gave this heartfelt speech. And she was nearly in tears. And I'm paraphrasing. I'm not going to be able to convey exactly how she said what she said. But essentially, she told the story of how her agent was trying to take her from her current publishing house 
to a new publishing house and how her agent was having the hardest time getting any real money for her in advance because of her sales history. Mm -hmm. Even though she has a very large readership, even though very many people have read her book, very few people have bought her book because nearly everyone who reads Esmeralda Santiago will buy one copy of her book and share it with her 20 friends. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, and I'm, these are not the actual numbers, but let's say 100,000 people have read, you know, her latest book. Well, only 10,000 copies have sold. Mm -hmm. And the publishing companies will say, we're not going to pay her for 100,000 readers if you've only sold 10,000 copies. We can only pay her as an author who sold 10,000 copies. We don't get paid for readers. We get paid for buyers. Mm -hmm. So she was nearly in tears. So, she, so basically, the, the, the moral of her story was, buy books. <laughs> don't share them. Right. She said it much more graciously than I'm saying it now, but she was nearly in tears when she told this story in front of a room full of people with a standing only, most of whom were there to see her. So, so, you, so I, your point is there are Latino readers out there. It's just that they're not buying the books. They're sharing them with. Yes, yeah, stop sharing books. It's but, not right. You're stealing money from the mouths of the children of the authors whose books you're reading. You're not doing them any favor. Buy the books. And buy multiple copies. Buy a copy for yourself. Buy a copy for your best friend. Buy a copy for your mom. Buy a copy for your kids. Buy a copy for your neighbor. Just buy a copy for Christmas. Buy a copy for everyone's birthday. A book is a great gift. Mm -hmm. but if Don't we, share them. You never no, share a book. What can we do, though, because if, if culturally it is just the way that it is and there are, you know, 40 million Latinos and this is the, if this is the, the sort of the cultural buying habits, rather than trying to change 40 million people, what can acquisition editor or author who is Latino do to change this? Not necessarily their, their buying habits, but uh, make the numbers add up or do something else that's going to move the needle a bit. Well... You don't change the world by throwing stones at skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. You change the world by taking a seat at the conference table because that's where decisions are made. Specifically in book publishing, you sit at Edboard, that weekly meeting where editors sit together at a conference table at a publishing house in New York City and decide what books get published and what books don't get published. So, you know, we as Latino writers and readers and Book lovers can stand outside the book publishing company's building and throw stones at them and picket and strike and complain. That's not going to change the world. The only thing that's going to change the world is to have more Latinos sitting at that conference room table. Mm -hmm. I know you have to go. I just have one more question for you, and I could spend all day long talking to you, but <laughs> unfortunately we can't because it's hard enough to get to you on the phone. You're so busy. You're an incredibly... <laughs> powerful and, and um, in-demand freelance editor. Um, but if someone is interested in being an acquisition editor and they are Latino or they are Latina, uh, what is the first step that they should do the, immediately after they finish listening to this interview? Uh, that's a great question because I was just going to say, this is what they need to know. There's one takeaway. It is this. There is a wonderful summer publishing course. Uh, given by the Columbia Journalism School here in New York City um, on the campus of Columbia College. It's called the Columbia Publishing Course, and it takes place every summer. It's too late now because it's August, but I would say in January, uh, that's when they pretty much, January, February, March is when they start taking applications. So anyone who is serious about getting a job in book publishing, especially an entry-level editorial job, take the Columbia Publishing Course. There are other publishing courses, but that is the premier one. I know for a fact that there are people in publishing who promote their assistance deliberately to time with when the Columbia Publishing course ends so that there's a new batch of graduates, and they will only hire people who have graduated from Columbia Publishing course to fill those editorial assistant positions. So you want to be in that class to improve your chances of getting a job. Second to that, because that, you know, that people have to wait to January and people will forget and it costs money. So the second best thing is to go to a website called bookjobs.com. Bookjobs.com is created by the AAP, otherwise known as the Association of American Publishers, and it's specifically designed 
to uh, college students and recent college grads and people looking for entry-level jobs or internships in book publishing, and they are particularly interested in creating diversity in book publishing. So it's geared towards uh, not just young people, but young people of color. But really, you could be any age and use bookjobs.com. One of the most successful editors I know is an immigrant from Canada, actually, and she was an intern in her late 30s, and now she's an executive editor at a major publishing house. So you could be an intern in your 30s. You don't have to be, you know, a teenager or in your early 20s to break into book publishing. Hmm. And I must also add that I think it's really important for people to sign up for your newsletter, which is at MarcelloLenders.com. And that's actually how I got my first uh, book publishing deal with Grand Central, because I saw an ad that was um, in uh, Marcella's newsletter. So that's MarcelloLenders.com, and that's M as in Mary, A, R, C as in cat. E L A L A N as in Nancy, D as in dog, R E S as in Sam dot com, Marcella Landers dot com. And I also really suggest that you check out her Compadres and Compadres Writers Conference, which is coming up when? It's Saturday, October fifth at Medgar Evans College in Brooklyn, New York. It's fabulous and I should mention the there's an early bird discount of ninety nine dollars which ends on Wednesday, August fourteenth, which is next week. So if you're thinking of registering now is the time to do it. So really invest in yourself if you're listening to this. You cannot get everything for free. If you really are serious about being an editor or an author or anything in publishing and you want to spend your money wisely, I really suggest that you invest in going to this conference because Marcella really knows what she's talking about. And what I like about Marcella, among many things besides the fact that she's a Virgo, is <laughs> that she really will tell you the truth. So she's not – she's working – She's working in the system, but outside the system. She's going to tell you the things that um, everyone else says behind closed doors, but refuses to say in public. She will just tell you the way that it is. And she's no longer suffering and living on mac and cheese and starving. You know, she's, I've seen her apartment. She is living <laughs> the high life now. And she's doing something right now. She's doing something right. So, you know, so really, really check out her. Her uh, conference, which again is Commodities and, and Compadres Writers Conference, which I'm assuming they could probably also check out at MarcellaLanders.com, right? Or is there well, actually, the, uh, the, I was just going to say thank you. Uh, the website for the Commodities and Compadres Writers Conference is actually uh, www.countonmebook.com. Okay. Countonmebook.com. So C-O-U-N-T-O-N-M-E-B-O-O-K. Uh, dot com. And this is going to have, um, like, what, what can we expect at the conference? Oh, my goodness. Practically everyone there is going to be someone who's passionate about publishing Latino writers. Uh, we're going to have Latino editors, Latino agents, or honorary agents and editors who have a track record, who have an actual experience and expertise publishing books by and for Latino writers, plus many published Latino authors. And we've, you know, everyone who's there, and thank you for those kind words about me, but I'm, I'm, telling everyone to be like me in the sense that, okay, you're insiders, but I want you to tell the truth. You're going to come to this conference, and you're going to be in the front of the room talking to a room full of people, and you're going to tell them what they need to know, which may not be what they want to hear. You're going to tell them step-by-step practical advice on how to get from where they are now, which is unpublished or unhappily published, and get to where they want to be, which is happily published. So everyone there is going to be giving advice like me. You know, like, this is what you need to do, practical, practical, step-by-step. And, and real deal stuff that no one else is really saying. You're not going to hear this stuff anywhere else. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Marcella, for your time. You are the busiest woman in publishing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> I am busy. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for your time, Marcella, and thank you for listening to the Jeff Rivera Morning Show. <laughs>